Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad you could all be here. It's an honor for me to be here in front of you to uh, be a part of the Historical Society's speaker program. So I'm very honored that they asked me to do that. And uh, we used to do this on a regular basis. We had a number of our cast of uh, Minutemen. Uh, we used to go around to the school. The last time I've actually done this is about 10 years ago. We went to the Chelsea school system and we presented to the uh, middle schoolers. So it went over quite well because they, they were studying the revolution at the time. So anyways, I uh, just want to give you a little bit of a, a preview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I brought along my supporting cast, Patty Bemis and Jeff Bemis. And I'd also like to recognize Roy Walters, who is one of our founding fathers of the uh, North Reading Minute Militia. <laughs> so tonight, um, we're going to do, uh, we're going to kind of be a tag team match here. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the origins of the North Reading Minute Men. And also uh, tell you a little bit of what we do. And then I'm going to go through what we wear and why we wear it. And then I'm going to tell you about what we do today. So uh, we've uh, evolved over the last 46 years. Uh, we basically, the North Ray Minute Militia started in 1975. And uh, it began because it was the 200th uh, anniversary of Lexington and Concord. So that was in 1775. So a number of uh, people decided it would be a great idea to form a, uh, a Minute Militia that would emulate the Minutemen that participated in Le at Lexington and Concord in Battle Road uh, back in uh, 1775. So Gordon Hall, uh, he got together with a number of his friends, one of them being Roy, and uh, he formed the, uh, the unit. And they started to train, and they drilled, and they uh, bought all the accoutrements, and they made all their own uniforms. Actually, they didn't. The men didn't, the women did. But they went off and did a lot of research, and uh, they found out what the individuals wore back then, either the men or men or the women, or, and the children. We had a number of children that were in the group as uh, drummers and pipers. The original group uh, was comprised of uh, 22 people. I brought this here because this is the charter, or this is actually the list that Roy Walters made up that lists the original members. It's real, real hard to read from back then, there, but uh, it actually, um, we actually had 22 members of the original group, and it was, it was comprised of also five drummers and five fighters, so total of about uh, 27. Today, we have approximately 15 members, uh, probably about seven that are actually active. Um, we basically, today I'm going to uh, refer to a write-up that I did about 10 years ago. It will give you a little bit of an insight of what, what we're all about. Let's see if I can read it without my glasses. <laughs> no, I'm going to have to depend on my glasses. And these aren't colonial glasses, but they're going to have to do. Okay, the North Reading Company of Minute Militia, their headquarters is the West Village Schoolhouse in North Reading Historical District, North Reading, Mass. We are colonial period reenactors and historians, town historical building restorers and maintainers. We perform community service to the town of North Reading. We sponsor, organize, and participate 
in the annual North Reading Memorial Day Parade. We actually organize it. We perform annual memorial ceremonies at three North Reading cemeteries on Memorial Day. We support and participate in the annual North Reading Veterans Day ceremony. We have re reconstructed and maintained the West Village Schoolhouse and the surrounding structures, of which I will talk about later. We support historical period class demonstrations at the West Village Schoolhouse. We participate in the annual North Reading Apple Festival, providing food and, soft, and a soft drink tent. We sponsor and conduct an annual country auction. Now that, we did that up until about, uh, I'd say about 10 years ago. That was a fundraiser for us. We no longer do that, but it's still in our charter. We also participate in colonial period events and celebrations. We did that more in the first uh, 20 years of our existence than we do now. We provide assistance and support to other colonial men organizations. Example, uh, we have participated in the Lexington and Concord and the Battle Road reenactment. We have participated in flag disposal ceremonies with the North Riding Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. We participate as color guards at community and corporate functions. And we initiated the fundraising and erection of the Veterans Memorials on the town common. We, we have been recognized as an outstanding historical and accurate organization. And we have been featured in John Hancock's insurance company calendar. So that's just a little bit of a background of what we're all about. Uh, today, let me put these down a little bit more authentic. Today, uh, well, as I mentioned before, uh, the first 20 years of our existence, we've been in existence for about 46 years now, if you do the math, from 1975. The uh, first 20 years of our existence, we've participated in a lot of reenactments. We used to go to the Manchester Freight on 4th of July. We used to participate in uh, Bedford flagpole raising, things like that. Um, but as our, as our company became older and was unable to march as much as we used to, we have become more of uh, restorers and constructors and craftsmen. Jeff, would you like to uh, give us a little insight on some of the uh, activities we're involved in or some of the antidotes well, at this really time. Really and then, really then I'll take over again and I'll talk about what we wear. Yeah, I've got a few more questions this year. I'm going to try without the mic. If there's a problem and you can't hear me, <clears throat> let me know. Okay. All right? Okay. And uh, I think the first thing that I want to talk about, because it, I, I found it interesting, is this bike. This is a whole this is a whole load of medieval warfare in Europe. And each militia company in the 17th and 18th century that drilled on the town common had a pikeman. And I was the pikeman for the first number of years in this. And I was a very misrepresented, a poor choice to be a pikeman. Can anybody tell me why? Too tall. All too right, tall. I'll tell you. Well, there's a function. It has to do with what the pikeman was supposed to do. And at that time, again, 17th and 18th century militia, they tended to do a military, European military style, and fire volleys at the enemy, stand in formation and fire volleys. Once the front line has fired their volley with their musket, fires one shot, they retreat to the rear, reload, and come forward again. The pikeman was supposed to be the biggest, toughest, meanest, ferocious guy out there because his job was to, whoa, to say, I almost wiped out the captain here. His job was to stand at the rear rank and make sure they went forward again and didn't keep going back. So that's what the pikeman did. 
Alternatively, if he had another job to do, uh, and they sometimes did, they could serve as flankers, what we call flankers. Um, when the British marched back out of Concord and Lexington, they were in formation, and the battle started, and they were firing at each other. And I told one of the gentlemen back here, it is alleged, we can't prove it, but it is alleged that the first shot for the war was fired by a Minuteman in earnest, meaning at the British, at uh, Buckman's Tavern, I think it was. They were waiting there for the British when they came back out of Concord. They exchanged words and insults. The British rear guard turned and fired a volley over the heads of the mob. Some of the mob didn't like it. They picked up their muskets and fired into the British ranks. And that started the shooting all the way back to Boston. The British got the worst of it, but we took a number of casualties. But what the Minutemen did not expect as they were firing on the British who were marching down the road trying to reload and fire on them, the Minutemen were behind stone walls and whatever. The British had flankers going through the woods on either side of the road. And the Minutemen took a hefty number of casualties from people with these kinds of things and more especially bayonets on uh, muskets. So that was a, a fact of it uh, that they had to learn about. This pike, is, it's a metal one, but if you look at it, it's a good replica. It was made for the company by one of our late uh, members. His name is Brian Rowe, who lived in uh, North Reading for many years. And he welded this uh, and made it for us. And we've been, we used it in parades for a number of years. The pikemen would march, march in the rear. That was my function for a number of years. And uh, when uh, the company shrunk a little bit, I took over the guide on, and that's where I was ever since. So let me put this back. And while I'm talking about this, is, I, want, I don't want this to fall on anybody. So we'll put it out of the way or save you. But I just wanted to, to talk about that. This is the company guide on. It's our treasure. It really is. I'm proud of it. Every function, every battle, every parade we were in, we carried this. Uh, in recent years, I did it. Before that, it was somebody else. And, yeah, it's got the flag. You can't hold that up as we're marching, but it's got. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that it's got many, many, many pennants. This represents an event, a battle or a parade that we participated in. And we won uh, or were presented with, with a, a, a pennant to put on our guidelines. And you see, we saw a lot of guidelines in other companies that, in uh, the late 70s that had more pennants on it than ours, ours does. But, uh, we picked them up from uh, events uh, many, many years. Um, we, we attended, uh, during, the, during the height of the bicentennial, 1976, 77, 78, we were invited, encouraged to attend conventions. Companies had their annual conventions in Boston. They set it up that way deliberately so that people could come in and take in the events that were happening. And uh, that they did. And when they had their convention, what did they want for entertainment if they could get it? Oh, if we could get some a militia group to come in and talk to us and demonstrate for us, shoot off their muskets in the restaurant, whatever. <laughs> come on in and do it. And they loved it. We didn't shoot off our muskets in the restaurant, but, but we'd go in with muskets. And uh, we had a convention with the Kirby Vacuum Cleaner Company in Boston. I uh, forgot exactly where it was, but it was near, uh, near the Central Police Station, actually. When we were done, we marched up the street uh, going west on Stewart Street. There's now the big parking garage that's there. But there was a restaurant called Whimsy's back in the 1970s. And one of our chief Participants was the chief of North Reading Police, Gordon Herberich. And he was petrified that day because we were going to be carrying muskets for which we weren't licensed 
and marched right by the police headquarters. He said, I'm doomed, I'm done, my job is over. Well, luckily enough, if they looked out the windows, they got a chuckle, they just watched us and let us go. We were marching toward Wednesdays against the traffic that was coming, and people were leaning out the windows, blowing their horns and cheering and waving and all that. It was, it was quite, quite an event, it really was. So we had a lot of fun with, the, with those engagements. One of our members was in the Navy in, uh, I think, the Korean War, Russ Carragher. And he served on the Essex carrier, so this is a mid-sized carrier. And the Essex was a series of naval vessels, vessels that had been built over the years. The first one was built in the late 1700s, and then they upgraded, obviously, over the years. And this was the Essex class, World War II Korea. They had their annual reunion down over here in Peabody, uh, I don't know, five years ago or so. So we came in and did a little presentation and talked to them, and they were thrilled with, with uh, with what they did. And by the way, I meant one more thing on Kirby. We have a company sword. Uh, is it here tonight? It's on. Okay. The company sword was presented to us by the folks from Kirby. And uh, we have uh, every year, or any time there's a new captain, and it used to be yearly, and now it's uh, a little less frequent because we have fewer members. But the name and the dates are inscribed on that sword. I don't think there's any more room to add any more names at this point for every time that uh, Captain Rich has been good enough to be our ca a captain for a multiple number of years now. So we may have, a, it may have run out of room, but I'm sure we, I'm sure you run there at some point. So anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let me see my notes again. I get one more thing. I think of one of them. Thank you, Jeff. I'll give you a break. Okay. You I'll come back with a couple more. Thank you, Jeff, for that common relief. Appreciate your insight. You'll hear more of Jeff in a few minutes. Um, I want to take the opportunity right now to uh, talk to you about what the uh, Minutemen wore in those days. And then I'm going to uh, give it over to Patty, and she's going to talk to you about what the woman wore. Women wore. So, Jeff, if you step up here for a second. Sure. Um, Are you gonna undress me or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Jeff uh, is dressed in the attire of a typical uh, Minuteman or uh, resident of North Reading back in 1775, in the 1770s. He has a shirt, obviously, a blouse. They called it blouse in those days, and it was made out of uh, either linen, cotton, or wool. Mostly okay. wool in the winter time. Now, what was unique about these uh, blouses were that you could also wear them as a nightshirt. If uh, Jeff was to remove his britches, <laughs> you'd see that it would go down to his knees. So they wore them, they doubled as nightshirts. And we used to have a member uh, who passed away some years ago. His name was Nick O'Brien, you may know him. He used to give this presentation back in the uh, 80s to the Boy Scouts and Cub Scout groups. And that's where I saw it. I moved into town about 81, and around 1984, we went to this Cub Scout uh, demonstration of the North Riding Minute Militia. And Nick, all of a sudden, through his presentation of presenting the attire, he pulls down and he drops his pants. <laughs> and he, but you couldn't see anything because it was this long blouse. So I'm not going to demonstrate on either his jet tonight. My blouse isn't that long enough. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine is, but I'm not going to show you. One other thing, if I could interject, these, these, these uh, are very uh, functional because they expand or contract. So if, you, if you're getting older and if you're putting on weight or losing weight, whatever, you can, you can alter these things. It's just, with a, it's just the way they tie. And the other thing I would point out is that in some instances, these things were passed down from generation to generation. There's a pair of primary pants to wear. Uh, what, if, alongside the blouse, uh, Jeff is wearing a vest, what you might consider a vest nowadays, but it's actually called a waistcoat or a waistcoat. 
And that was typical of uh, what a colonial Minutemen were wearing in those days. I also have one on, but it's more military style. And this is pretty much what the uh, Continental soldiers wore back then. And Jeff is wearing, as well as I am, uh, breeches. They're called breeches. And they were, uh, you could tighten them or loosen them with the uh, buttons on the side. And also, as Jeff mentioned, they were very roomy in the seat, as you can see. <laughs> And they were drawn together by uh, um, lacings, so you could let them out and bring them in. Plus, they didn't have zippers in those days. <laughs> yes. They weren't invented. So they were, they had drop, they had uh, a drop panel, basically that was buttoned in the front, like, like my, mine and Jeff's. Very, very difficult to get out of in a, in a hurry. <laughs> But anyways, in addition to that, we've, they also wore typical shoes where, I don't know if you can see them, but as I walk around, you might be able to see them. Uh, the shoes, what's unique about them is that they were not typically sized like they are today. In other words, uh, you did not have a right and a left shoe. You had one shoe or two shoes. They were both the same size. I mean, you could get them in lengths, but they were not right and left. So that's what these shoes are. And they molded to your feet. The more you wore them, they became a right and left. And they were typically uh, buckle shoes. They did not have lace-up shoes in the 1775s. The women may have, but the men did not wear them. Okay, what else? Oh, um, <coughs> Jeff is uh, showing an open collar blouse right now, but typically uh, the men when they got dressed up or if they went to battle sometimes, they used to wear a, cr a cravat. It's a tie that would lace around your, uh, your throat, and you can also use it to wipe your brow, or if you were near a stream or something, you could use it as a washcloth. Anyway, in addition to that, um, typically, and Jeff is wearing one as well, this is called a knapsack. Uh, typically today, a knapsack, if you picture, it's usually worn on the back. Most uh, military soldiers wear them on the back. But in the colonial days, they used to wear them over their shoulders, and they used to carry their their correspondence, their food, letters, whatever. They didn't have uh, many pockets, although my jacket does. And uh, the jacket I'm wearing is basically called a short coat. They had longer coats, obviously. You've seen them in movies. But this was more typical of a, uh, a captain or a uh, so, uh, officer of the time because it was short and you could move very easily and it, it didn't get in your way. And it was wool. It's made out of wool. <clears throat> also, we wore a tricorner hat. And what was unique about these hats is they used to wear them corked to the side because when you use your musket and you marched with it, you had to keep your hat out of the out of the way. So basically it was not worn straight forward, although you see it in the movies that way. But a lot of times it was off to the side because most most people carried their musket either on the right or the left shoulder. Um, it was also adorned with what we call a carcade. And that was a decoration that symbolized uh, the particular unit you were in and the colors that you wore. So this particular one is a seal of North Reading. And every one of the uh, company at the time and currently uh, have one of these carcades and one of these seals. So when you march with other units, you could tell 
who was a party or who, who wasn't, because the Caucasians were different colors. So that completed your basic outfit, uh, along with an knapsack. Now, when you went to Lexington or Concord and Battle Road, you added a few accoutrements. You added your pouch, which carried your your ball and your shot and your powder. And you used to put your ball and your shot in this pouch and carry over your shoulder the opposite way. And you carried them back at you like that so it wouldn't get in the way where you were running or marching. Uh, in addition to that, you might get thirsty. So you would carry a, a typical uh, yeah. canteen. In those days, it was made of wood. So this is a reproduction of a colonial can canteen. It has a, a cork stopper on the top. And it used to hold about uh, 16, 20 ounces. You got a number of things you put on before you went into battle. Okay, in, to, in addition to that, uh, a lot of the colonial uh, Minutemen carried their powder in a powder horn. So that would go over the other shoulder. They didn't, they didn't have microphones in those days. <laughs> okay. How do you show these? <laughs> so the next thing I'm going to talk about, well, this this pretty much completed your uh, attire for uh, preparing yourself to go to Lexington and Concord. <clears throat> With the addition of your weapon. Uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Typical of those days, um, a lot of the uh, Minutemen that went to Lexington and Cork in those days and trained as middlemen, uh, Minutemen were veterans of the uh, French and Indian War. So that happened around the 1760s, 1750s, 1760s. And so they came home with the muskets that they were issued back then when they were part of the British Army fighting against the French and the Indians. So this is, this is called a brown vest. This is typical of the uh, a fowling piece or a weapon of that day. It was not called a rifle. The reason why is because it was not rifled. Uh, it was a smooth bore weapon. In other words, uh, today's rifles, that's why they call them rifles, because they had rifling inside. And that made the bullet, when you shot it, go straighter. It put a spin on it. It made it spin, yes, that's Second right. Football, when it starts spinning. Exactly, exactly. So, um, this is also called a flintlock because it had a, a mechanism that had a flint and it had a prison here. And what you would do is you had a, a rod, a cleaning rod, basically. And, a, and what you would do is pour the powder down there and the ball. And then you would pour a little bit of powder from your powder horn in the top pan here. Then you would close it down so the wind wouldn't blow the powder out of the pan. And then you'd aim and shoot it. And it took uh, a very good minute man could probably prime and load within about four or five seconds. Really? 
So in the British Army, it was actually they could do it about that fast. Depending how how uh, well, they also used to use them for hunting. So uh, once they made one shot, if they missed what they were shooting at a deer or something, they'd have to load really quickly so they could take another shot. So um, so that's the brown bess, and that was the typical weapon of the day when they marched on the way from North Reading to uh, Lexington and Concord. Now, if we had been outside, I would have had powder in it, you would have heard a loud boom, right? And that's what we basically do when we uh, uh, do our ceremonies on Memorial Day at the uh, at the grave sites or at the cemeteries around the uh, around town. We usually fire three volleys, and then we. We fire one volley, then we reload, and fire another volley, reload, and fire another volley. Uh, and we also do the same one thing on Veterans Day. So if you attend the Veterans Day or the memorial services, you'll, you'll hear us fire, and you'll see us fire. So uh, that's pretty much, uh, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to show you. Let me take my accoutrements off. Oh, by the way, this is not called a uniform. We do not wear uniforms. We wore a tire. The only ones that wore uniforms were the actual Continental soldiers, and the British, of course. All right, so the other thing I want to demonstrate is it's part of the men and men and part of the units of those days, they had drummers and fifers. Put this down one second. Make sure I put this on the right way. So they added another layer. I don't have a pipe to demonstrate today because I don't know how to play one. <laughs> But anyways, um, the drum was used for a number of things. Um, basically, in a Minuteman unit, or in the Continental Army, it was used to signal and call the troops to uh, order. So they had a number of drum beats uh, associated with that. Um, so each one of the units had one drummer, at least one drummer and one piper. And they not only used them to call uh, the troops to order, but they also used them around the campfire to provide entertainment. So music, so they learned various musical tunes and things like that. You've heard them if you've ever been to a, uh, a colonial reenactment. So the basic uh, assembly would sound like this. And that would call them if they were sitting around, whatever, or milling around, that would call them to order to line up. And, uh, and usually when they fired, you'd uh, give one extra drum beat. Uh, you'd do a drum roll well, before they fired, and then to signal that they should put their muskets down, you'd just give one drum beat like Okay. So then, they also used them for memorial services, which we, which you'll see if you do it, uh, if, you, if you come to any one of the memorial services we did. And that's kind of like a dirge. No, it's a very slow beat. And that's basically, you lead, them, lead up to the memorial, up to the grave site. Uh, then the other thing is, you may have, a, when you're marching, it's a little more of a livelier beat. So, that's what the drum was used for.
we still use it today. Okay, at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff and give you a little more comment for later. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, we're going to change that program. We're going to hand it over to Patty and, and give you, have her give you some insight as to what the women wore today. I've shrunk in my whole day, so I step on my, the bottom of my outfit. But this is a typical farmer's wife's outfit for everyday work. You, I have an apron. I also have a pocket that I could put things in. Um, and my shirt or blouse is long for a night shirt, too. Um, so it's pretty much, I'm set for 24 hours. I don't have to really, I would take my bodice off and my skirt, but um, that's what they did. They wore this type of stuff daily. I do have with me um, a dressy gown, which was not worn very often. Mine needs to be starched so it looks pretty but drank <laughs>
that he had, which is just like his father's, um, <coughs> having the little tucks to make it fit. And of course, he had different haversack, just like his father. And this was the last size that I have. He would have gone into a men's size. And the colors are all colors of stuff, like I could have used blueberries um, to get this. The green would be you know, grass or, or something. You dyed your own clothes and um, I made the buttons out of dowels. <coughs> And technically, his outfit, just like his father's, just in miniature. And these are the pants. Which is, and that's the flap. And that's how you can make, pull them in together. So you've got quite a bit of room. When in sewing, you have a fan inside that gives you extra give. And then, as we got older, you want to bring the capes? Yep. He, he minds the cold, so we have to have a, his is an authentic cape. which his has extra warmth around the arms and it's quite a big collar so that you can pull it pull it up halfway up his head and you've probably seen him if you've gone to any of the town things yep, coming handy in the cold weather that's for sure in the wind and mine is similar but I do have a hood but I'll confess, I went to the pattern, got a simplicity pattern and made it. Because <laughs> there was nobody interested in making in the group, making something for warmth. And I figured, well, I get cold too, I want something. My daughter had one in blue, but the moths got it. She must have spilled some food and didn't tell me, so. It, it got holes in it. So anybody have questions on women's clothing? A good question. What about um, foundation garments? Yeah, that's what I would like way of putting it. I mean, they didn't have rods. No, they didn't have anything. Yeah. Was there any lacings of any sort? Or yes, this, I have lace. Um, I mean, you don't have to show it. No, but it's it's on my collar. It's also on my sleeve. No, what I mean, let, uh, the foundation. It, there's no bone ain't no much. But she, you didn't. Um, was it just all hanging loose then? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you tie you tied it in. <laughs> People got one to know, you know. I did. I know. You just the ties would hold. That's okay. That makes sense. And bloomers, I assume. I don't think they have bloomers. We were given patterns for it, put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Patty. Okay. Um, to round us off, I mentioned earlier that we became. Um, we evolved from reenactors into more or less builders and craftsmen. Uh, and that led us to restoration of town buildings and uh, moving the buildings from where they lo were located around North Riding 
into the historical district of Putnam properties. So, um, with the exception of uh, a flagpole, which we recently installed, this is a picture of the buildings in the historic district that we have erected over the years, in, in the last 46 years. And uh, this is the West Village Schoolhouse. And I invite you to come down to the area and take a look for yourself. We do open them up at certain times during the year, so you can look at the inside. Because they are uh, built exactly the way they were back in the 1700s, 1800s. So this is the West Village Schoolhouse. This is uh, Sergeant Flint House. And this is the first meeting house. This, this was the first building that we erected in the, in the um, historic district. And we originally, uh, well, it actually was taken down. It was at the corner of Park and Main. And um, we actually, it was before my time. They raised it around 1981. And it took uh, about 10 years to be actual, actually uh, completed because in those days, they had to figure out how to raise money to build it and restore it. It was completely taken apart. And it was stored in the back of the historic district and behind the Putnam house. And so I joined about 85. And so I was a part of the actual construction of the building. Uh, so then the next uh, house we, we worked on was the Sider Flint House. And that is a reproduction, actually. It contains some of the original beams of the original Sergeant Flint House. And it is, Sergeant Flint House was said to be the first building in North Reading, the oldest building in North Reading. Of course, if you go into it today, you only see some of the original beams, which are in the ceiling. And this building here on the right is a reproduction of the first meeting house in, in North Reading. And that, we uh, recovered that in, I think, 2013 or 14. Uh, it was a part of um, Sidney Eaton's house. The older gentleman that used to ride the bike around town before he passed away. It was an extension of his house. His house is still there. As you, if you've driven by it, you can tell that it's quite old. So we were, uh, we were asked if we wanted to take that portion of his house down back in, 19, in 2013, 14. Because there had been some research done on it and it was attributed to be the first meeting house. So we took it down and we resurrected it in, in its entirety in the historic district. And last but not least, um, during this period, around 2015-16, maybe in, my dates probably aren't that accurate, but we erected a, a, um, a farm museum because, uh, as you, most of you know, this uh, community was a farming community. And there were a number of farms that were located around North Ray. And so people had a lot of uh, artifacts and machinery from those farms and they wanted to donate it and they wanted some place to put it where people could see it. So that was another project we took on. So we put it in the form of a, a horse barn. So that's where the, uh, the design came from. These uh, drawers here, they basically would have housed carriages. But today, they house farm machinery. So if you ever get a chance, when we have the building open and you haven't seen it, come down and take a look. Jeff, would you like to 
speak? Yeah, a couple, a couple of uh, quick things, if I may. Looking back on a couple of the parades that we did, uh, a couple of the events that we went to. One of them was on Battle Row back in 1976, I believe, over in Concord, Lexington, and they reacted that battle, reenacted that battle. And one of our distinguished members, and it was on a hot August day, the heat was quite high. It was humid, uncomfortable. And one of our members was the father of Tommy Parker, Bob Parker. And he went on this trip with us. Very distinguished looking gentleman. He looked like a colonist from A1. No question about it. Well, we kind of had talked among ourselves and a little concerned because of the heat, and we said, well, I think we probably better just keep an eye on him and make sure he's okay. Well, by the way, during the running around and shooting the muskets and the gunpowder going off and so forth, we looked around, no block power. He wasn't in sight anywhere. So, uh oh. So we spread out and started looking for him. Not to worry, this man turned out to be the star of the day. <laughs> and when we found him, he was posed on a rock, pointing his musket towards the British. He was being filmed, and he was being interviewed. He was on Channel 5 News that night, and then he was on the cover of Americana, I think it is, magazine the next month. So we didn't have to feel badly for him. One of the other quick, quick things that we did, which was really unique and was something I'll never forget, we served as part of the Queen's Honor Guard when the Queen came to Boston, uh, the tall ships. We had to line up on each side of the road as she approached that was right near the city hall. And we were told, you stand at a town. There was my, you, you were with me, and my, it was wife, husband, wife, husband, that kind of thing, all in our outfits. Stand at attention, you look straight ahead. The Queen may choose to come over and say something to you. In that case, you can, may respond to her. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut and listen, keep an attention. We did that. And lo and behold, the queen came up, she looked right towards me, I thought. She came right over and yeah. talked to a lady right next to Patty was over here, it was Marilyn Holmes. She talked to her for a couple of minutes and then took off on it. I'll never forget that, that was something. Um, we, have, we have a very unique company, I think. Many militia companies have folded following the bicentennial. I'm sure you've got Concord and Lexington and Bedford, they're, they're here forever but some of the other companies have sprung up, then went out of existence. And really, uh, one of the things that, that talks about us and, and, and it makes us, I think, a little different, one of our members recorded a poem in November, a short poem, in November of 1980, as we were trying to struggle with the, all the, the, the ramifications of, of the schoolhouse. And by the way, I was up and several other members in March of 81 on the roof of that schoolhouse. We were young guys that had taken off placards in a northeast snowstorm. We had to move it. That, we had to finish that that weekend or we were not going to get it. So that's what we were doing. I remember those days. Never forget them. He, one of them wrote a poem. And uh, I have to say one other thing. There was a school in town called the Putin Point School. It was on Eames Street, or in Eames Street area. It, it uh, built, I think, in 1840, and it burned in 1845. What replaced it was the uh, West Village School, located uh, Mill Street, Tommy, somewhere in that area. And that's what we ended up moving. So, so, and you referred correctly to that. But a lot of us sentimentally referred to the project as the Putin Point. So it's got a second name that's always stuck with, the Putin Point School. North Reading Minutemen have rediscovered Putin Point School, and for the last three weeks, each man has brought his tool. The old schoolhouse at the corner of Bain and Park is beginning to creak, groan, and come apart. The fellowship of working together is so much fun. We are discovering the past, and yes, keeping our wives on the run. Each Saturday, our women serve coffee breaks and dinner, with what they serve us, we will not be getting any thinner. <laughs> End of the poem. I think in conclusion on my part, I would say what makes us unique in a way, in a sense, is we first in our early years, we really, we relived history. Then we started to make history for ourselves by restoring history in North Reading. And that's the North Reading Minute. Yeah.